Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Small Farms Winter Webinar Series. This is our 2020 edition. Hard to believe that 2020 is here. Uh, this is being hosted by the University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farm Team. We really appreciate you coming back and joining us for these webinars, and we're going to do our best to begin and end within this lunch hour. We know this is a tight time frame for our educators, so we're going to um, try to limit your questions to the Q&A box this year, new to Zoom. Um, and we'll try to get to those questions at the end, um, as many as we can. Um, this presentation is being recorded. So I just wanted to inform you of that and we will let you know that there's gonna be an archived version of this presentation. We'll email you the link after, as soon as possible after this concludes. There'll also be a link for a very short online evaluation of this presentation included and we really appreciate your feedback for these webinars. I will also start sharing a screenshot of a QR code that links directly to the, the evaluation at the end of the presentation. Um, so this will be a little bit new that we're trying this year. We'll still send you the evaluation via email if you can't scan the QR code. Um, but for those of you that have the QR reader or if you just open up your phone on your smartphone, you should be able to scan it. So we're using Zoom's webinar platform this year. So there's a few additional features I wanted to point out for those of you that are unfamiliar. First thing is that there's actually a poll section at the bottom of your uh, webinar toolbar. Click on that poll and you'll find a voluntary and anonymous demographic form uh, that will be very helpful to us in extension. So go ahead and fill that out at your earliest convenience. There's also both a Q&A box and a chat box. The Q&A section is where I'd like for you to put your questions that you have for the presenter and either I can answer them, someone on our panel, or we'll save them for Nathan at the end. Um, and if, if you have any technical issues, you can reserve those for the chat box. So a little bit different than usual, um, but I just wanted to make you aware of those issues. So um, this week's presentation is from Nathan Johanning. Uh, Nathan is, is one of our fellow educators on our commercial ag team in Southern Illinois. He was formerly a part of our local food systems and small farm team uh, in Franklin, Jackson, Perry, Randolph, and Williamson County. Uh, but we, we still work with him um, and, and, and we love his input here on webinars as always. Nathan's background is in plant and soil science with the emphasis on weed science. He joined Extension back in 2013 and he's involved in a lot of different things. Now, you know, he, he's involved in agronomic uh, corn and soy crop systems, but he's also very involved in specialty crop systems, particularly with cover crops, no-till, uh, fruits and vegetables, pumpkins. And today he's gonna talk to us about asparagus production and marketing. So we're really excited about that. And I'll go ahead and let him take it from here. Thanks, Nathan. No problem. Uh, thank you, Zach. I'm happy to be here and happy to share some about asparagus production and marketing. So we will go ahead and uh, jump right in. All right. Uh, first, with especially with asparagus, I want to talk a little bit about the general traits of the plant itself and biology because it is a little bit unique compared with many of our vegetable plants. The main fact is that it is a perennial and a fairly long lived, uh, lived perennial. Um, so with that being said, you need to think a little more closely about where you wanna plant it, site selection. Uh, you can easily get 15 plus years of productivity. Uh, certainly I've heard of asparagus plantings that have lasted 20 plus or even longer. Some of it depends on your individual conditions and, uh, and, how, and the maintenance it's received over that time. But, Either way, with, with good care, uh, it can be very productive for many years. Uh, relatively free of disease and, and insect problems. There's a few more things that have, uh, have come up in the last few years and previously, but compared with some crops, it is, um, it is fairly robust and, and handles, um, just handles our conditions in the Midwest fairly well. So first on the growth habit. Uh, when you look at asparagus, the spears originate from buds on a crown with the largest buds first to grow and then each successive bud is smaller from there. So you'll have this crown and when you order crowns uh, to plant, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of buds at the end of it. And uh, from there, basically year after year as that grows, that crown gets larger and larger. So all those underground buds continue to grow and, uh, and from there, uh, that crown will get larger and will increase your yield over time. So the biggest thing with that is because you're growing that perennial crown, you do not wanna prolong or over harvest 
just a week in the crown. And later when we talk about harvest specifically, we'll get into some details and some good recommendations for starting off uh, the, the harvest length of time and how you can manage that. So first off, especially as you're making a planting, uh, would be looking at your site and how are you going to uh, choose a good site and then once you've chosen it, uh, prepare it. Uh, since it is a perennial, making sure our soils are have the nutrient test levels needed is is just very critical. Um, you just uh, because it's a perennial, if you don't go in and have your basic um, pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium all in balance, uh, you'll have can have nothing but uh, but nightmares, and there's really nothing that you can do. Um, quickly anyhow to make those amendments without some tillage uh, and those aspects, which is, is really not able to do once you have it planted. So that, that's really important to, to consider in this. So, so we're looking at wanting to do, uh, you know, have that soil test and with that a well-drained soil if possible, or at least an area that has good surface drainage, um, good sun exposure as is most all of our uh, vegetable crops, and then limited perennial weed pressure. If you have lots of issues with, um, especially other briars, perennial grasses, um, certainly any of your vines, poison ivy, uh, Virginia creeper, anything like that, those really need to be managed uh, well ahead of time. Um, you know, there are some uh, chemical herbicide options, uh, but even on, on the non-chemical side, you you really come down to having to to hand weed um, beyond that after some of those aspects. So if you have a, an area that is, has a lot of problems with some of these pesky perennial weeds, uh, you, you just need to try to get them under control as best you can. And certainly there will be times where um, over the life of this, you know, that there'll be other weed introductions and things that you have to deal with. So you at least want to start clean and, and start ahead versus uh, trying to start to behind your, uh, behind on weed management. So uh, target soil test value. So whenever you start off this process, I would say at least uh, six to 12 months prior to planting, you wanna test and then amend your soil prior to planting. That's really the biggest thing, you know, some people, you, so realistically, if you wanna plant asparagus this spring, um, unless that you have your soil tests line up really, you know, fairly close to where you're at. I, I really th uh, think you need to, um, you know, you need that extra time, not just, it's not something you just go out and say, hey, I wanna order this on a whim uh, and then throw it in the ground. Certainly you need a soil test, at least know where you're at. You want ideally to have a pH between uh, 6.7 and 7.0. It's a, a little bit closer to the neutral side. A lot of our vegetables are we're maybe in the mid sixes, maybe somewhere between like 6.3 to 6.7 or so. This is a little higher than what we would typically have for some of our cropland, although sometimes we, we may have fields in this condition. But certainly, if you have fields that have pHs below the mid sixes or even in the fives, you know, we need to make uh, amendments with lime to, to bring that pH up. Asparagus does not like the, the highly uh, acidic soils. Uh, for phosphorus is the other important one that I have listed here and kind of bolded in red. Uh, phosphorus, we really wanna see a soil test value of around 250 pounds per acre. This is extremely high for any other, um, almost probably five, four to five times higher than what I would recommend for general vegetable production or even just crop production in general. But because of the perennial nature and, and the, the advantages of trying to incorporate things like phosphorus and also potassium into the soil, that's really where, uh, where we need to be. Uh, so once you are getting ready to plant, just at planting time in general, we look for around 75 pounds of actual nitrogen would be applied. Um, and then if your soil test is not available um, or, or certainly at a certain point, uh, depending on your acreage, you may not be able to add enough phosphorus or potassium or, uh, or enough lime maybe at once to, uh, to make some of those amendments to achieve some of those values. Uh, a good standard recommendation is 200 pounds each of uh, 
of P205, phosphorus, and then K2O, which if you looked at uh, a product like triple superphosphate, which is O460, you're talking around 435 pounds per acre to equivalent to that. And for potash like 0060, that would be equivalent to around 333 pounds per acre. Um, that's, uh, that's a fairly high rate. And from there, you can uh, do surface amendments, but certainly to amend further from there, but starting off, at least at that level, or if not higher, is uh, is going to be really adventitious. So, uh, I again, I can't stress that enough on on both of those that, to at least make a good effort to make some applications. Uh, certainly, we like to do these applications. You know, we don't be putting on a thousand pounds of uh, of triple superphosphate or something at one time, but um, know where you're at and and, may, and make a good application. And if you need to. Uh, making surface applications, uh, say annually in the spring, to help kind of continue to bolster those test levels is certainly a good way. But you just want to know where you're at and go from there. All right, here's another table. This actually comes from the University of Kentucky. Um, their ID36, which is a vegetable production guide. I like this guide for all kinds of vegetable crops because it directly gives you soil test results and then it gives you a range of fertilizer to apply. So it's very soil test related, which is what we need for phosphorus and potassium where we rely on our soil test results. So this table is, is just a really good, um, a good example of, of another way to interpret those test results and to tell you how much uh, phosphate and potash you need to apply. So when you're planting crowns, um, most people are going to plant one-year-old crowns and that's probably what I would recommend and if I was going to put in a new asparagus planting that's the route that I would probably go if, uh, if available. Um, this, Usually I'd want to have a soil temperature of at least 50 degrees. Uh, so more similar to what maybe you would plant, um, you know, corn or even transplant some of your uh, summer vegetable transplants out. Um, hold those crowns at around 33 to 38 degrees until planting. Um, uh, so, and make sure you, you order in crowns whenever you know the, the soil temperature and soil conditions are appropriate. So with that, a lot of these, for these situations, you're gonna be working with a, you know, directly with a commercial nursery that is going to be, uh, that is gonna be growing these plants themselves. And they have the best, you and your best interest in mind as well. A lot of them, you can, I would go ahead and say, place an order now or, or early, and, and they will say, well, when do you want them delivered? You can say, well, ideally, um, say if it was in Southern Illinois, we might target maybe late April, uh, or early May. Um, and so you can set a date and often they are very good to, if you can talk to them, like, you know, if, if they said, we're going to ship May 1 and you see that uh, May 1 is coming and there's just no way it's wet or something else that you can't get into the field, um, call them. And most of them are really good ab about saying, you know, hey, we'll hold on to those for another week. Call us because we would much rather have, have us hold them in our cooler uh, where we know that we have the the temperature and humidity right to preserve them, then to give them, send them to you, and and maybe you don't have as good of facilities uh, to keep them cold, and then you have a bad experience with those crowns because maybe you weren't able to store them as well. So do work with your uh, a good nursery that raises these crops will work with you because they want you to be happy as well. Um, separate those crowns uh, into different size categories and, and plant a cat uh, according, accordingly. Usually we say that because a, a larger crown that you're planting will be more vigorous than a smaller crown and sometimes it can be easier to manage harvest and, and even other operations if you kind of plant them in a, in a gradient versus just planting them randomly. Uh, this, is, this is just more of a a kind of a cursory example of a way you can kind of, uh, I guess a, a finer way of kind of uh, manipulating your planting and kind of the, for more of a commercial production is knowing those larger crowns to be more productive. So certainly it's not absolutely essential, but it is something to consider. Uh, so also if you take in, in furrow, apply around a hundred actual pounds of diammonium phosphate, which is 1846-0, or something equivalent, uh, you can actually apply that in furrow 
uh, in the basically the plowed furrow where you're going to plant the crowns. That is, uh, and it doesn't hurt the crowns. And, and when you figure it out, it's not a, not a, a huge amount. Um, but it, what it does, it gives a good direct boost of a little bit of nitrogen and then phosphorus right underneath those crowns to give them some additional start beyond the, the general amendments you've done to the soil. All right, so there is an option of planting seed. Uh, seed is less commonly done, uh, but if you do, start in plug trays in a greenhouse. It takes around 10 to 12 weeks for transplants to get to their full size. You can see in this top picture, uh, you have uh, the asparagus seeds. Below that, we have um, so young seedlings that are ready to be transplanted into cell packs. And then uh, below, you can see some transplants that are ready to go out into the field. So um, whenever you plant them, you still need to, you need to plant them fairly deep, similar to a crown, which is what we're going to talk about next. And you need to plant them around five inches deep. Uh, what we have done prior times is to actually plant them with a bulb planter and actually stick the bottom of that crown down deep and then kind of backfill in the hole. Um, was one way to achieve that. Some cases, uh, that's on a small scale. Some cases you still may want to plow open a furrow and set the plants in that way. But the biggest thing is you'd, uh, no different than if you had a crown itself that you would, would set down uh, deeper in the soil, you need to make sure to plant the base of that plant uh, deep in the soil and don't just plant like you would a, a tomato and just stick it in right at kind of ground level with the plug. So you need to delay the first harvest until year three with when you're planting from seed, whereas when you plant from crowns, we can get a small harvest in year two. So general planting recommendations, uh, rows five to seven feet apart. Um, remember that plants can reach five to uh, six feet in height. I've even seen some a little bit taller when they're mature and in late summer. And the crowns will increase in width and size. So you'll start off with a crown with just a few spears and that crown will easily, even after uh, four or five years, might be uh, eight to 12 inches in diameter. And so uh, make sure to space things accordingly. Think about uh, maybe um, you know mowing equipment because it is handy to be able to run a mower down between rows. Uh, and certainly you can go wider if you want to. We like to keep for the, the efficiency and, and number of plants and amount of crop yield we can get per acre. The five to seven feet is fairly common, but you do need to figure out with your equipment and situation what really works best for, for your operation. Um, <clears throat> So uh, with that, uh, within the row, usually we have a plant spacing of 12 to 18 inches. The, how you determine which way you want to go, a closer spacing would result in higher yields earlier, but after a few years, there really isn't any difference. Those crowns expand enough and will compensate for that. Um, so in some cases, uh, you know, I would you know, I would probably say because of the efficiency and the fact that it's cheaper and it takes fewer crowns per acre at 18 inch spacing, I think uh, an 18 inch spacing would be adequate unless you're really wanting to push that early season yield. Also, another consideration in a way would be if you your equipment lends itself that you want to have a wider row spacing, say seven feet, maybe even a little bit wider than that, then maybe you would want to go to 12 inch spacing just because you can still fit a few more plants in per acre uh, to accommodate that added row width that you might want for your specific setup. Um, Crown orientation as to which direction you put the crown in isn't uh, isn't really critical. Usually how they'll be laid is all of the roots will be pulled back one direction and the crown will be at one end. So I usually always do try to place them in the same direction. If you can imagine, um, you know, imagine having, uh, they're all oriented the same way. Um, and also trying to, when you look at it, you'll see where the buds are at. And if those buds are up, they will emerge a little bit quicker, but in the end, the plant does figure it out fairly well and is not a big deal one way or another. How you're gonna plant, as you saw in the earlier picture, uh, a middle buster or moldboard plow or old potato plow to make furrows is the most ideal. Um, you wanna plant crowns uh, five inches deep on, on heavier soil, six inches deep if you're in sands. There's many uh, tales of, of you know, needing to plant them 12 or 18 inches deep. 
um, uh, just on a production scale that just for one thing isn't practical and really isn't necessary. And on, and on heavier soils like we're at uh, most of the area in Southern Illinois where I'm at, um, it's really too deep. Our soils are too, stay too wet and the asparagus just can't handle the, the wetness and five inches deep is, is more than adequate. Um, so uh, deeper planting at some points will give you some larger diameter spears, but sometimes a little lower yield. So in some cases um, you're, you're kind of slowing that crown development, maybe a little deeper, but the, the buds that are there are a little more robust. Uh, but overall, I think for a commercial planting, somewhere in that five to six inch deep is, uh, is adequate. Uh, use a, a small blade to place soil back into the trench, um, probably over several weeks. So you could uh, run some soil over and then um, go back again a little later alongside and, and lay some more soil over the, uh, over the top of those, uh, those crowns. So here you can see another picture there. They're laying down the crowns. You can see here that right by his thumb is, is kind of the, uh, the head end of the crown. And you can see as he has all those crowns in his hand, they're all oriented the same direction. You can see the crown, which is that uh, kind of larger part of the end is all in that. So it's always good to put those all going the same direction. So they're, they're evenly spaced. Otherwise, if you have crowns pointing the opposite direction of each other, then you'll have two of them that, that may actually come up maybe six inches apart versus, you know, 12 or 18. And then likewise, there might be almost a two foot gap the other direction. Um, you can use a, uh, a moldboard plow. In this case, they had a three bottom where they had taken one bottom off and they were just plowing up with two. Um, whatever situation you have, we've always also used a single bottom plow or whatever is handy and convenient on your farm. But certainly that's a great way to make a nice even furrow. Just be careful and set that depth accordingly. All right, so now into different types of asparagus. There's green, white, and purple asparagus. Um, naturally, most asparagus is green, uh, although with some cool temperatures, you'll get a little purplish coloration. If you look in the bottom picture, you can see some of the green asparagus with that a little bit of a purplish tint to it. So white is simply grown in the absence of sunlight. It could be either the uh, green or purple varieties. Um, but you really do need to, you have to block all of the sunlight out. It's called blanching, where you're growing plants in the absence of light. Um, and this would command a much higher price. This is the standard that is uh, procedures that's used over in Europe for asparagus production. You really don't see um, green or purple asparagus at all in, in Europe, and they actually kind of kind of frown upon it uh, and, and aren't, uh, are not, just don't consume it. It's all the blanched or white asparagus. Um, but uh, in, there, in that case, all the spears actually grow up through a, a mound of dirt, which is then covered with usually some kind of a tarp or plastic on top of it. They go through daily, and when they see that soil start to bulge underneath that tarp, they reach down with the, those asparagus knives, and they cut it and pull it up. And then it, when they're done, they have to recover it and go on from there. Uh, the short of the story is, is it's extremely labor intensive. So this, if you did grow blanched asparagus, this should command a much higher price. Um, but realistically, uh, our United States market uh, is really not have the, the taste and preference for the white asparagus so much that uh, I think you really need to go through uh, that effort to be successful at marketing. But it is a new avenue if you want to try something different. Um, purple varieties are a specific variety they are higher in sugar content and they have that purple skin pigment. It will cook out a little bit so they don't keep that same bright purple color. They tend to fade a little bit more to kind of a grayish color. However, uh, I've, I know that the, um, I know that the, the purple varieties by many have actually determined uh, to have a much, uh, much higher saleability. Some of the people that have had some purple wish they had planted more purple asparagus. And I think it is the closest thing to the taste of the blanched asparagus without having to go through that. Uh, you know, one of the comments with the green asparagus is in especially Europeans say it has a very uh, green taste or, or herbaceous taste to it that they don't prefer. The purple asparagus doesn't have that as much and is really a good, a kind of a good alternative and, and certainly a good niche within asparagus that you can't really find in most stores. Uh, 
All right, varieties. Uh, you want your hybrids are going to be higher yielding. There are old varieties such as Mary Washington, which are open pollinated and do produce, will produce seed. The problem with that is then they will come up as a weed in various areas. And so a lot of our, our asparagus varieties are male hybrids. Um, they have a lot higher yield in production and no seed production on top of that. So asparagus hybrids, um, you know, there's various ones, Jersey uh, hybrids, um, such as Jersey Supreme, Jersey Knight, Jersey Giant, and many others, um, Wealth Millennium, uh, and also Pacific Purple, Purple Passion are some of the purples. There's also some California hybrids. Um, these are dioecious and do have male and female plants. They are adapted more for really warm climates. Um, things like Atlas and Grande or some of those. They do have a little taller, uh, slender spear growth um, and grow better again during those higher temperatures. They're not... Um, there's some that have tried them in Illinois and I think and in the Midwest, I think some of them do well. There haven't been any, um, any, any strong preferences one way or another. The thought, especially if you're in further south in the Midwest, that they would handle some of the heat a little better and have better spear quality. Uh, however, so that's something to, uh, to consider. So now I have some cultivar data I just want to share kind of quickly with you. And so just to lay out this slide very quickly, you'll see the cultivars, all varieties, all listed on the, uh, on the left of the screen. And then you'll see different years throughout there. So what this is looking at is they each year, they rank the varieties as number one yielding on down to number 12 yielding. And this was a, a colleague, uh, Carl Cantalupi, that worked in... Uh, and NC State and had actually had some previous history to uh, asparagus work in Illinois. Uh, so you can see as we go through the years, one thing to note is that it bounces all over the place. Um, so some things to, to look at, some of the ones highlighted in, uh, generally speaking, highlighted in green are the ones that, that just I have felt from looking at that had uh, a better probability that they were gonna be in say the top half of the rankings. Um, it's Jersey Giant, Jersey Supreme. They did have the Atlas and Grande, two of the California types, and they were, uh, you know, yielded and did perform fairly well. Um, and then also they had Purple Passion and Millennium, which, uh, which also did fairly well overall. But as you can see, it does vary, and so it's sometimes hard to make these determinations um, off of some of these trials. But these are, over time, looking at these can be some really good information for you. So... That was some information from on the East Coast uh, that would be applicable, but we also have a asparagus variety trial uh, at the Extension Office in Murfreesboro. Some of you may have been to programs out here. These were crowns planted in 2014, uh, and uh, there are 20 crowns in each plot, and we have four replications of each of 12 different varieties. Uh, we did have the addition of, of two varieties as seedlings in 2015. So you'll note Pacific Challenger 2 and Pacific Summit. Uh, you'll see they often trail out at the end, uh, of, but we still did include some of the information. But do remember that these data would be around three years behind uh, because of getting planted later and getting plan planted as seed versus crowns. Um, so we first harvested in 2015 for two weeks, and that'll be the first data you see. And throughout, we graded the di we graded them by diameters of uh, small being a quarter inch plus, and then large being a half inch plus, and then an extra large being one inch plus in size. So here you can see, we'll start off with 2015. Uh, I'll just lay out these slides. We're just gonna fairly quickly go through the, the data uh, for, these, uh, for these first years, just to kind of show some of the differences. All of these slides, you will see that the varieties are listed in order of the amount of marketable weight of spears that they had provided. So you can see that uh, in this case, uh, Mondeo was our number one yielder, and then on down to Jersey Knight was the lowest yielder. So that will be the same throughout. Also, the, uh, the black line you see through the middle is a cutoff line. Anything above that line performed at or above average when we average all of the yields for that season, anything below the line would be below average. So although that's not uh, necessarily 
necessarily statistically important. It gives you an idea, looking across all of them, uh, where they would fall or where would be kind of a, a fallout line, which what would be basically an at or above average uh, variety for that season. So the varieties we had, uh, Mondeo, uh, NJ1122, which is now called Greenox, Millennium, Pacific Purple, uh, Jersey Supreme, Mary Washington, which is our old open poll pollinated standard, Jersey Giant. We had NJ1025, which is now known as Porthos, NJ1113, which is now known as Sequoia, uh, Jersey Night, and then I showed you the Pacific Challenger and Pacific Summit, which you will see uh, data for those coming in the future years. Note all of the weights are listed in pounds, and these are calculated based on the pounds of yield per 100 foot of row of asparagus at those uh, plant and plant spacings we had. So uh, as you can see, we also have the data uh, split out as small, medium, and large, if you're at all interested in how a certain spear size. And the total marketable is simply just the combination of all spears, small, uh, large, and extra large. Anything cold would be misshapen or otherwise deformed, or if it was smaller than a quarter inch in diameter, in this case, we considered that, uh, considered that call. In your operation, you may be able to make use of those, but often those small um, eighth inch spears weren't, uh, weren't terribly marketable. So here, you, starting off, Mondeo uh, and Millennium and also Green Ox were some of the, some of the high performers. We move on to 2016, which is the third year of the, of the trial. So here you can see Mondeo again up at the top. Uh, and we actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of high yielding, uh, higher yielding variety Sequoia, Green Ox, and also Jersey Giant uh, had kind of risen to the top. So uh, continuing on, I think in 2017, we saw similar results. You can see as time goes on, those crowns are building and our annual yields are increasing. Uh, I also will note, if you look up under the year, you can see our harvest date. So we had a little, our increasing in our harvest length. Uh, you can see the dates within which we harvested. Uh, so here, um, Sequoia, Porthos, Mondeo, Green Ox are all performing uh, very well. Jersey Giant is within there. And even this time, Mary Washington even squeaked in, you know, at or above, above average. Uh, 2018, uh, we had, uh, you know, Porthos, uh, Mondeo, Sequoia, Jersey Giant, Green Ox were some of our, our favorites, Pacific Purple. Uh, all came in, you know, in this case, anywhere, you know, at least, uh, you know, 23 pounds per 100 foot a row or greater across the whole season. And then on to this past growing season. Uh, again, Porthos and Sequoia are right up there, Mondeo, Jersey Giant, and Pacific Purple, uh, along with this year, even Jersey Knight had, did perform, uh, perform very well. Uh, certainly this year, uh, Porthos and uh, Porthos was certainly a, uh, a, a yield winner with the really very good uh, yields and actually Sequoia Mondeo as well. So you've seen all those different things and we've rattled through the different ones uh, and I've, I've looked through them. And so what would I take away from this for our site down in Southern Illinois? Um, obviously, you know, our yields are increasing, uh, but we do have some consistent performers. So these are the ones from our trial, which is again on a very heavy wet soil. So we're, we're really, I think, challenging these to heavy soils to see their performance. Uh, Porthos uh, and uh, Sequoia, and Green Ox, those NJ numbered uh, number varieties, also Mondeo, uh, Jersey Giant, and then I think they're purple for us, Pacific Purple is good. We did not have Purple Passion in our trial to compare it to, but I think those uh, those are good. Millennium is is a fairly new one as well as popular. I'm, I'm kind of, I put a question mark, I'm kind of on the fence. It never really performed poorly, but however, it, uh, it's always kind of stood kind of in the middle, but it's certainly a popular one you hear about. And I, I think it does do uh, fairly well. Um, again, Pacific Purple, I can't stress, is, is I think is, is a really nice purple and does produce a lot more larger diameter spears compared with a lot of the, the other varieties. All right, so that was just a little bit on variety selection. Uh, so now on talking about harvesting. Uh, so to harvesting, are you going to snap uh, or are you going to cut? 
So that is the big question for many. Uh, I would say my vote, if it was me, is I would probably snap them off. Uh, you can literally just take your hand and, and kind of run it down the spear and just kind of give it a bend and it will naturally want to snap uh, above the most woody area of the, of the stem. What that does, it gives your total yield uh, a little bit lower although it's 100% editable and you can market that, that this is all edible. You know, so many people are used to getting uh, asparagus from the store and they naturally cut off the bottom few inches of it. Um, so uh, because often it's cut and when you cut, the tendency is to cut it, you know, right at or even maybe below the soil surface, it's often very woody, uh, very stringy. And, uh, and so having that 100% edible um, gives you a premium, not to mention being a, a, a locally raised and fresh crop. Um, cutting you can do, certainly that's what they do um, where they have the blanched asparagus and need to, but uh, you can get a little higher yield, but again, you're selling some really parts of the stem that really aren't usable. Um, and you can, there is a risk of damaging developing spears with that knife as you're going through the field. So uh, my tendency, and I think many of the growers will just, will just snap and they're very happy with that, especially the marketability aspect. So field management. So this is just kind of taking a glance at a given year and what would you be doing when? So two to three weeks prior to the beginning of harvest, you need to make sure, if not prior to that, you mow off or in some cases burn, uh, reduce dead stalks uh, and, and get rid of them. Uh, so you, want, you need to get rid of those. As far as the mowing, I have actually gone to, when available, even going into maybe uh, November or December, if I can get out in the field, uh, or any time throughout the winter, especially when the ground is frozen, depending on your soil conditions. Uh, for us, in, for Murfreesboro, that was one of our stipulations because it would generally just be too wet to get across it with a mower. Um, there is some slight advantage to burning from the fact that they do say it can reduce some inoculum for diseases. However, I've heard some recent research that if any reduction in disease you would get was only temporary at best, and really didn't turn, uh, didn't have any long-term impacts uh, on disease management. Uh, so typically, the first emergence for varieties does vary. You can, if you look back through that data, uh, you can see our first harvest varied a lot. Sometimes it was the first of April. Sometimes it may have been the mid to end of April. Um, but in Southern Illinois, I would say from mid-March to early April is whenever you start to see the first emergence. Now, first emergence and their first harvest are often different depending on the weather, just because that you can see spears you know, sticking out of the ground a half an inch doesn't mean that you'll be harvesting, especially when temperatures are cool. Um, when to mow again, um, some do say that the, especially in colder areas, it's nice to have the, the ferns help to um, kind of, keep the soil a little bit cooler because they're shading the soil in the spring, which can reduce some of the early spring frost injury. Uh, so that, that can be a benefit. We've had issues with mice and voles out in the field. So especially over winter. So we like to reduce that habitat and trying to get a mode before spring. Uh, and also for us, it's also manage a point of trying to get out whenever we can get across the field uh, at an adequate time. Again, usually for us when the ground is frozen. Uh, so you would apply, generally apply a pre-emergence herbicide or burn down herbicide. And for all the recommendations for that, I would go to the, this website. And if you do a search for the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers, you can get, uh, that would take you to this link and you can download a PDF or you can actually purchase a paper copy of this. Great resource for all kinds of pest management and vegetable production. Um, if you are using glyphosate or Roundup, be very careful no spears have emerged. You have to uh, be very careful, and that's why I would suggest going out and scouting early. Um, I will scout even as early as... Um, you know, even as early as the first of March, and I will watch and see. You know, are we getting emergence? Where are we? Uh, where are we seeing some? Um, you know, seeing any issues because I specifically want to you know avoid that. So beyond that, there are some options where we would also take and uh, and we would you know you can use mulches on 
on your asparagus for field management, for weed control. Um, uh, you know, there's other options, flaming, um, you know, even some of the, if you're looking on organic production, some of the OMRI approved uh, herbicides like horticultural vinegar on very small weeds could, uh, could be an option, but we really do want to start, uh, start the season off fairly clean. And, and that is important. I really do uh, do discourage um, any or much of any tillage. Some will do very, very shallow tillage, um, but you have to be you know, only an inch or maybe two, um, but you really have to remember you're also opening up your soil to be more prone to erosion, and, and which is already fairly bare to start with, but you really, um, you really need to think about how you would, um, again how, how to manage that and if you do till there is that risk that if you get a little bit deep you can damage your crowns and that can have long lasting impacts on the longevity of your planting so any damage mechanical damage uh, to the crowns would be you know detrimental especially long term when you do harvest um uh, your harvest pick it early in the morning when the field heat is at its lowest because you want to get those spears when they're cool. Um, pick into plastic tubs uh, with some holes to allow for drainage. Um, we, because of, of having that asparagus being fairly uh, warm and you have that cut stem, you want to make sure that when you do, uh, if you do wash it, that you do wash into water that is no more than 10 degrees colder than the crop. If you have greater dispersions in temperature, what happens is that temperature gradient will cause that crop to take in water. And what we don't want is to take in what could be potentially dirty wash water and suck that up into that crop, especially since we do have that open wound from cutting. Uh, it does have, asparagus has a very high respiration rate. So if you can hold it around 36 degrees, that is the best to maintain optimal quality. And you can store for, in many cases, up to two weeks at 36 degrees. You want to store it upright um in in a dark uh, refrigerator or, or refrigerated area some cases uh, they say in shallow water or i like to if nothing else just make sure you're controlling the humidity uh, making sure that you have humidity control and are keeping that environment at a high relative humidity uh, in some cases that could mean maybe just covering the spears with plastic so that way they're they're not desiccating. We know many of our, especially um, standard uh, refrigerators, are uh, tend to desiccate and dry things out. And so you need to make sure that they're in, say, in a plastic, large plastic bag, or that you do something to manipulate and maintain good humidity in that environment, or you will lose crop quality a lot faster, even at the correct temperature. Um, you want to harvest spears around seven to nine inches long is ideal. Um, the spear tenderness or toughness is related to how tight. So those little buds at the tip of the spear should be very tight and shouldn't be opened up. Um, if they're more open, that tends to be a more fibrous spear. And temperature is what dictates the spear opening. At temperatures over 70 degrees, uh, spears will fern out uh, at a shorter length, which then necessitates picking of shorter spears. So, oft, so in some cases you can't uh, quite get that nine inch long spear, especially later in the season. And with this, when it's 90 degrees outside late in, say, May, on some of those days, you might be picking twice a day, while it, on days when it's only 60 degrees, you may only be picking every two to three days. So temperature is e extremely uh, indicative for your harvest. Uh, and that's, uh, we saw this this past season, it stayed very, very cool until all of a sudden, uh, later in May, the, the temperature turned up and it, it got up into the 80s and 90s and we had very, very limited harvest. And then I think our harvest um, doubled or tripled the amount we were harvesting uh, in, the, in the latter part of May when the temperatures really, uh, really got going. So harvest management. Uh, beyond that, um, do not allow just smaller spears to be unharvested. Those remain as hosts for asparagus beetles, which we'll talk about. Uh, and remember, you know, the, t the picking is, is relentless. Uh, in this picture below, you can see this is actually a, a homemade asparagus harvest apparatus where you have seats that on a, would be an old uh, wagon frame that has a, a really slow speed drive. So that way you can, um, you can creep through the field have, and not be just walking and bending over constantly uh, so that that harvest aid can be uh, very beneficial and there's various things out there some really nice uh, nice harvest aids out that go for strawberries asparagus and things like that that if you're doing any size area would would probably be a very worthwhile investment uh, but harvest is relentless and, and for many weeks and and uh, and on a daily basis 
So your length of picking for most of your male hybrids, that first year of planting, year two, um, you can, with crowns, you can harvest for about two weeks. Um, so you can get a short harvest. Some cases you will see they maybe don't recommend that, but they research has shown that you can do a small harvest that those that year after planting your crowns and, and not have any negative impact. But you, again, you need to limit yourself. And it's hard because you'll see those, uh, there'll still be more spears after two weeks and you'll just be getting a hang of it. But do limit yourself so you don't uh, have negative impacts for the life of your planting. From there, year three, harvest about four weeks. Uh, year four, six weeks, and then from year five on, your harvest of around eight weeks is is adequate. So these are estimations and kind of a good gauge. The, the actual harvest will depend on the health of the planting and then weather conditions. The best rule of thumb is to discontinue picking once you know, three quarters of the spears are less than three eighths inch in diameter. So say about pencil sized in diameter. If you start getting a whole bunch of small, small spears, if you remember the, large, the bud with the largest spear comes out first and it gets smaller at that point, you know that that, you're, that plant is really getting to, into the smaller buds and, and you really, that plant is starting to struggle a little bit and you need to stop harvesting. So then you can let the ferns grow and that will replenish and grow that crown for future years. So over harvesting uh, can be a, a temptation, but if you really are in this for the long haul, um, you really do need adequate fern growth. And that means not only not to harvest, but you don't wanna go through and do uh, and, and blanket mow the whole patch in the summer while those spears are still green. Um, all of those spears are building up carbohydrates for that crown. So anything you do, whether you're actually harvesting it or if you just mow it off, it's almost the same, same difference. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, doing everything to maintain those spears and they're feeding that crown um, until you get, um, get to the fall whenever they turn brown and desiccate and, and die off. So generally speaking, um, what would you look for for yields? Uh, I showed you some specific yield data we had. So on a per acre basis, roughly say 500 pounds per acre that second year, maybe uh, 1,000 to 1,500 the third year, on so on, 2,000 pounds the fourth, 3,000, 4,000 or so for future years. 10 to 15 years of good production, uh, is usually ideal and often you'll see those yields start to decline. But again, this a lot has to do with your site and how well you've, uh, you've maintained those, uh, those hybrids. Maintaining soil fertility um, for nitrogen, I think you know, really uh, you know, around 75 to 100 pounds of actual nitrogen per year. Uh, and I would ideally split this before harvest and at the end of harvest about half and half. That way you're giving the plant a good boost uh, early in the season and to get it off and going. And then once you, uh, at the end of the season, whenever we'll talk, whenever you mow down the spears and let them uh, do like a, a final weed management, uh, then you can give it another boost to get those ferns up looking kind of like you see in this picture below. Um, phosphorus and potassium need to maintain that soil test level. So uh, I would also refer to, uh, I would soil test even so year two or three after you've established Soil test again and then see where you're at. Use like that Kentucky guide that I recommended. Look at that and then use that to gauge you know, your amount of phosphorus and potassium you need to put on. At a certain point, once you get up to these levels, you, you really don't have to do a lot of annual maintenance of phosphorus and potassium if you get these levels and maintain it. And again, I would, I would be on a regimen of, of at least every two to at least four years doing pulling a soil test to make sure that you're in that range and not climbing too high, which means you need to back off on the fertilizer versus uh, too low. Uh, and then you need to you know, add a little bit more. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about pest management. Um, asparagus beetles are probably one of the biggest insect pests we have. The adults feed on developing spears uh, and they cause injury that causes the tips to bend, which makes them not as marketable or desirable. Um, they will also lay eggs on developing spears, which you can see in the top picture. Uh, and that is not, uh, not very desirable uh, from a marketability standpoint. They do come off if you do rub them, but the, uh, with any quantity, seeing uh, eggs laid in quantities like you see there on spears is not uncommon with an, an unmanaged uh, asparagus beetle 
infestation. And so you can easily get a situation where you have a lot of spears with a lot of eggs and uh, limited desirability be because of some of that. Um, again, those small unharvested spears are sites for asparagus beetles to lay eggs on. So if you remove those, you're going to, uh, you're going to have a, a better just cultural control uh, to start with. Um, so what could you do? Um, it, we do have multiple products uh, such as 7XLR, Pounce, uh, Sale, and there's some other um, pyrethroid type insecticides that do have a one day pre-harvest interval uh, that can be used uh, in asparagus production. Um, usually uh, we would say uh, whenever you, you need to watch the spears and a little bit of asparagus beetle feeding is okay, but whenever you start to see multiples, uh, uh, when you see at least five to 10% of the plants that are infested or have eggs on them, um, so even just, uh, you know, even one out of 10 or 20 plants, that's when you, or 2% of the spears you pick up have any eggs on them would be kind of a threshold. Uh, and usually often it seems like every year we will make one application, maybe two at most, and then we can keep them at bay. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, as last that I had, uh, had referred to the spray guide and look, we don't have any labeled OMRI approved uh, insecticides that are effective at asparagus beetles. So that is one limitation. Uh, some on organic production have looked at some of the lightweight row covers or insect netting to help prevent them. It is a, a, a decent sized beetle, maybe at or slightly smaller than a lady, lady beetle. So, uh, so you could do some efforts for exclusion, although they are very uh, persistent and, and often will uh, we'll find a way uh, to, uh, to access those spears that they want. Black cutworms can be a problem. You'll see they're feeding and they cause this very typical kind of twisting and curling of spears. Sometimes they'll cut the spears even completely off. Uh, again, when you have uh, similar products to before, when you have 5% of crowns that are infested during harvest, that would be a trigger to make a, a, an application to help manage them. Uh, and it do, again does vary. Uh, and there are other things that can cause some of this, this twisting as well and, and curling even mechanical injury or, uh, or wind abrasion or things as well. There are just a couple of diseases, uh, purple spot being one of them. Uh, it is uh, sunken purple, the oval shaped lesions on the spears. You can see a little better on the lower pictures. Um, it does overwinter on residue. Uh, and this can cause some premature fall dieback and result in overall lower yields the following year. Um, we, we don't have, we've been looking at this and researchers, especially in Michigan, as far as uh, where it's a little more common up further north, uh, have been looking at control measures and using products that contain mancozeb and chlorothalonil uh, during later in the season, especially during fern growth, especially under very wet conditions, say, um, you know, if we had like a, a July or August that turned off very, very wet doing, say, weekly or every 14 days doing cover sprays to manage uh, and watch for that disease as you scout will help prevent it. There is no curative action. And, and so it is, it is a challenge. Uh, some cases growers will just, uh, will just deal with it and, and, man, and, and try to uh, promote the growth of the crop and health of the crop to provide in uh, make sure we don't have any issues, but that's one issue that we do see a lot. The other one is Cercospora blight. Um, it's fairly similar, does the same thing. The, the lesions are oval tan to a little bit of a reddish in color with brown borders. Um, so it will also call pre cause premature fall dieback and causing lower yields because it's similar to removing that fern that's building up that crown. Uh, wider row spacings for uh, for better airflow can be helpful, and the same products, you know, even around 14 to 21 day intervals later in the summer when you have full fern canopy and especially high humidity and moisture conditions can help reduce it. Uh, however, uh, again, it's something to watch out for, and especially for the long term um, viability of that planting. You can also have some crown rots. Um, most, there's not a lot you can do for this. The biggest thing is making sure that your plot is not over harvested. The pH and phosphorus are maintained adequately. Your pest pressure is maintained and that you do pick a site that has you know, fairly good drainage and doesn't stand water uh, and things like that. That is probably the, the biggest thing is culturally is to manage it is in your site selection and then just managing the health of your, uh, of your planting. 
weed control. Uh, the biggest thing I would say on weed control, aside from referring to the spray guide, is not salt. So salt is something that has a long time been uh, in garden, home gardens. I said that salt is in no ways even good for the soil. Um, asparagus spears will tolerate salt um, because of their robust uh, root system uh, and ability to thrive in a little bit higher pH soils. But long-term applications of salt can do horrible things to your soil, which can, are practically irreversible. Uh, so don't use salt for weed control. Um, Mulches, as I mentioned a little before, straw or other weed-free organic materials can be great options, especially if you're looking for organic approaches to uh, weed management. Uh, some of that can depend on scale and, and whenever you're mulching that area, but certainly works very well. Um, so for herbicides, you wanna plan for at least one application before spear emergence and then one at the end of harvest. So when you look in a spray guide and we could have a whole discussion just on weed management, um, you'll see, um, applications made after harvest. And there are products, both foliar, things like Gramoxone or others that can be sprayed at the end of harvest that won't injure the crowns. You'll, you'll mow off the crowns right level with the, or the spears, excuse me, right off level with the ground. And then you can make an application of that along with some residual herbicide products, uh, as you can see listed here. So there's various residual products that have uses either before uh, spear emergence early in the spring or uh, later, some of them can also be used um, whenever you're at the end of harvest. Things like Chateau, Diron, Dual Magnum, which we just have a new label for use of, uh, Dactyl, Treflan, Sencor, and Prowl. And those really do provide a lot of weed suppression beyond just using something to kill off existing weeds. They really go a long ways at keeping that field clean. You can see this is an example above of a situation. Uh, we actually had one year where the weeds escaped and with all that weed competition, that is equally uh, hindering those spears. So you really do need to maintain it, not to mention you're building up a weed population in your patch. Um, so again, I did mention shallow cultivation. However, um, I really do kind of discourage that just from the fact of, of the potential to injure the crowns. So some other concerns uh, would be frost. You don't want to encourage extra early growth um, because frost uh, and spears are very frost tender. Uh, if you do see a frost or freeze coming in mid harvest, I would make sure that to harvest even a little extra heavy, even if you pulled some shorter spears, because a, a frost will give a very water soaked look to some spears. And, and so those will basically, you know, die off naturally or otherwise won't be marketable and you'll have to wait until new spears emerge. Wind and hail can cause crooked spears. Anything that mechanically injures that spear, it will want to curve or twist in that direction. So uh, kind of wrapping up here, talking a little bit about marketing. So how is asparagus marketed? Typically in one pound bundles, maybe other situations if you're working with restaurants or other, uh, other entities, you wanna keep cool and hydrated like we mentioned for the best quality. Um, it is really a great companion crop to things like strawberries, rhubarb, or some other early season vegetables. If you have a high tunnel and have greens early in the season, great compliment because most of your harvest is going to be mid-April through uh, on into May. Um, you have a really good competitive advantage. I would always push and market this. You have a fresh, crisp, sweet, completely usable product um, that uh, many people I, I've seen, you know, they, oh, I don't really like asparagus and we'll, I'll take some fresh asparagus and cook it for them. Uh, and, and they love it. And they say, I didn't know asparagus could taste this good. And there really is, a, of many of the crops, this is one that there, I think, really is a competitive advantage for fresh local asparagus. Um, also include some recipes, look up and find, uh, find some recipes, include that for people, give them some ideas, um, even starting off just quick ways of, of how to steam it, how to, how to grill it uh, and things. Cause sometimes people that maybe aren't as akin to cooking don't even, they don't even know how to, uh, how to just do a basic preparation. So give them a little, a little hint on how to use it. So from some farmer's market price range uh, from Illinois in 2016, we had this asparagus is running somewhere at a market between 335 and around $5 a pound. 
Um, and you can find more links to that through if you do Illinois Farmers Market Price Report. Um, expect wholesale prices to be around 50 or 60 percent of retail. That can be discouraging to some. However, remember that that store is is doing all the marketing, sales, and other aspects for you. And if you have a large quantity, that really can be a good way to get a further reach than maybe you can as for direct retail. Value added products. There's many um, commercial kitchens that are out there and, and willing to make things like you can see here, asparagus, guacamole, uh, pickled asparagus, uh, and, and things of those sorts. So you can market that throughout the year. Um, you can use over production that you maybe otherwise would have to pitch because you don't have a, a market for and add that to something that extends your marketability. So I want to kind of wrap up by looking at some resources here, and, and these will be uh, shared, of course. Uh, I mentioned the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and Kentucky Guide, and Kentucky also has a commercial asparagus production fact sheet, which is, which is a really good re resource. And if you do a search for either any of these, you can easily come up with these URLs, and they'll also be available, of course, through the recorded slide set. I also do want to make one last plug for a fruit and vegetable newsletter that we have uh, in Illinois. Uh, myself and Bron and Ailey are the editors, and, and throughout the season, we are constantly providing updates. A lot of updates I will provide even on asparagus and uh, among other crops. So certainly uh, email myself or Bronwyn if you're interested in receiving email notifications of the newsletter. And with that, I do uh, thank you all for uh, attending today. And I know we are right, I think right at one o'clock, but certainly if, uh, if we have some time, I'm happy to answer a few questions for those that are still able to, uh, to stay on. Yes, th thank you so much, Nathan. And yes, we are at one o'clock, so we'll, we will go through the questions. There actually is a handful of questions and I'll try to group them together and curate them for you. But if you sure. need to get off the call, go ahead and get off the call. Remember, this is, will be recorded and you can come back to the question uh, section, but we will probably be on for another 10 minutes or so to answer these questions. So, so uh, um, let me just first ask one question I had before jumping into these questions. With your phosphorus and potassium recommendations, Nathan, I noticed in the book yeah. that if your levels were optimum or, or where they needed to be, there was still a recommendation of zero to 20 pounds for phosphorus and potassium. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a yield response, even if your levels are where they should be, or do you recommend still adding some phosphorus um, or potassium if your soil levels are okay? I would say you, um, you know, and it, it showed in, you know, in that zero to 20 pounds, which of course is, is a fairly modest, uh, modest uh, rate, but um, I would say that it isn't a bad idea just to, to add some, um, but the biggest thing is make sure when you're soil testing, your, your levels aren't trending up above optimum. So if you start getting, you know, phosphorus levels that are up 300, 350 or things like that, or likewise, you know, 400 pounds on potassium, you just, you know, take a break for a few years. Um, and, and the soil has a great ability to hold those nutrients. And, uh, um, and, uh, and so you don't need to worry about, um, you know, making application. Certainly you don't have to every year make phosphorus and potassium applications. So. Right. Okay. And then just really briefly before I get into mm -hmm. the audience questions with your, with your uh, trial data, uh -huh. did that black solid line, was there st statistical difference between those yields? I didn't see the. So, so no, I, I mentioned, I do not, that was just, that was um, simply observational looking at the, the average where the average fell and what was above or below. I did not I have not had a chance to dive into the statistics on this, which um, in some cases, 25 harvest and six years worth of data. I will just be honest, I have not had the time, which would probably be a couple of days worth of statistics um, work okay. for me. So that, so no, I do not have the, um, the, the actual um, mean separations for, for all of that data at this point in time, but that is, that is on the to-do list. So. Okay, great. So I'm going to try to to lump some of these together. Sure. And maybe you can kind of answer them. So there's definitely a few categories here with um, some of the pest pressure questions and then a few with uh, weed control. So let me try to, uh, and you may have addressed some of these and I tried to note that in the comments, but I'll just kind of go through these and see if we can come up with some answers. So so someone, there were some questions about organic equivalent practice for applying burned down herbicide and you kind of gave some of those. Uh, along those same lines, how do you pre-harvest mow slash burn without injury to an unharvest crop? Um, and when would you put a mulch down if you were going to use a mulch? And then something about, uh, there was a question about scuffle hoeing and smaller production systems safer uh, for shallow cultivation. 
captain of weed management. So I don't know that I can kind of re restate those if, if that's too much, but do you sure. have- Sure, no, and I did pull up. I think I have some of the questions um, that pull up in front of me. Um, but so um, the, orga the organic equivalent, um, so I did mention, you know, flaming or like the horticultural vinegar or some of those products would be, would be an equivalent. Um, we don't have any, um, that, that's uh, at least from my experiences, those are probably the best products. Maybe, uh, and of course, those both have to be used with very small weeds. Um, but that's, that would be the best short of doing some shallow cultivation. Um, so that, that is, um, that would be my recommendations for in, in organic type systems. Um, so how do you, uh, mow or burn without injury to the crop? Um, so the asparagus spears go completely dormant. They die back to the ground to that crown, which is, you know, five inches below the soil. Um, no different than, um, as far as the burning part, no different than like an ornamental grass, like a pompous type grass that you would, you know, some would burn or something. So, uh, so you can, uh, you can run a mower right down to the soil surface, no different than if you did shallow cultivation, um, would actually has a greater potential to cause any problems than mowing or burning. So you're going to mow or burn, say between somewhere between November and the first of March, sometime when there is no green vegetation out the exception to that is you will also you can also go through at the end of harvest so maybe let's say june 1st and you can go through and mow it off again right to the ground you will mow off a few smaller spears but you're trying to just have a completely clean cut of um uh, uh remove all the spears and it's especially important if you're using any of the herbicide applications because what you're doing is you're effectively removing the leaf surface area that would be exposed to any herbicide uh, which is how they're able to use some of these other um, products that have residual applications and even using burn down products such as gramoxone or other things that would would basically clean off all other small uh, small emerging weeds and things so there's uh, in that system that's how you would uh, would do that uh, another mention to um, uh, some uh, 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 organic practices uh, would be um, you know just mowing so mowing down row middles um, um, is can be a, a very good way to manage weeds uh, some people I know even will seed some grass um, if they have a wider spacing in the middle of their rows. Uh, granted, you know that that asparagus crown will, will creep out into there eventually, um, but certainly just spacing it so you can drive a mower down if you aren't using residual herbicides, other things can be a good practice. Do remember you do get still get some competition, but if it, mowing can be a good tool, you know, that any of us could uh, could utilize. And then any sort of, so the, the scuffle hoeing specific question mm -hmm. in terms of, I mean, any sort of shallow cultivation, as long as you're not going down too deep, it doesn't really if you matter can, what if you can, If you could keep your know, rotary hoe or something, if you could keep it, I think, uh, below, not greater than an inch, even two inches, I think it'd be really pushing it. Because those crowns, even if you plant it five inches, there's been some research to show that depending on their... Um, your soil conditions, that crown will kind of move itself up or down and, and kind of grow more at the level of the soil where it's happy. So um, just because you planted it five inches deep doesn't mean that it may necessarily be still at five inches. So, uh, you know, maybe even a potentially like a rear mounted tiller that you, you set the, the skids up that you're just barely skimming the surface. But do remember though that you know, anything that you cause, you know, that kind of mechanical injury can just open up wounds for disease, especially fusarium and some of these root rots. And so I just, I, I, I know in some cases it's necessary, but I, I just kind of try to discourage it. But certainly, you know, very shallow things like, like rotary hose or some of the other, there's all kinds of other um, mechanical weed control aspects that I may not even be 100% familiar with. Um, newer innovations uh, are, are certainly adequate, but you know, just keep that in mind. If you can stay within, especially the top inch, inch and a half, two would be very, very max. Would be where I'd want to keep those operations. Okay. Um, back to some the 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 farm that asked the question about the not damaging crowns. Something about pre-harvest, though. So after harvest, but pre-emergence of new crop in terms of dam. I guess I'm not super clear in terms of what what they're trying to say with with that question um there's quite a few here more so i want to get through some of these yeah um so i do see a couple on on asparagus beetles um 
I do not. Uh, there are some predators uh, out for, for asparagus beetles. I don't know of any that are commercially used that you could say let out into a field uh, and, and help to manage, um, manage asparagus beetles. Uh, I think, uh, and I don't also know of any, at this point, know of any uh, uh, predator or, excuse me, repellents. Um, uh, I, again, uh, with the, um, on the organic approach, um, I think probably exclusion or just, um, you know, trying to just discard uh, spears of eggs on them and just trying to culture no different than kind of, you know, picking insects off of, of plants when we try to, when we are pushed to that situation. You know, if there is a spear that is just completely, you know, just covered in eggs, you know, harvest it, put another pile. Um, I don't know if you want to say you want to burn it. Don't just lay them in the edge of the field. Um, remove them from the field area so they don't hatch. Uh, and, and maybe you need to harvest, uh, increase, or, or excuse me, decrease the interval of time between harvest, harvest more frequently, because those spears come up really rapidly. And the faster spears grow, the less asparagus beetles you see, but it's on those times when you're harvesting every two or three days, those beetles go in and start laying eggs. Um, you know, I know there's exclusion netting and things might be a potential option. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's some netting options that, that some organic growers are going to for other crops. And, and so that could be, uh, they're not in place all the time. So you could scout them. And if you start to see asparagus beetles, then you could try to do exclusion and not have to be at an everyday, uh, project, but certainly, um, that is a challenge. Like I say, I think of, of the Omri approved insecticide products, uh, the last I checked, there aren't any, any labeled for asparagus beetles. So that's yeah, kind I, mean, of I would the, think Pyganic would probably be the closest, but I don't know if it's labeled for it or how, even how effective it would yeah, be. Yeah. The, the last, at least the last spray guy did not, you know, we didn't have a, now that doesn't mean that there aren't some new developments and I'm sure there might be people looking into, to products. Uh, I don't, I think some of it was even just finding effective products that could be used, especially in such a short turnaround. Um, okay. in a crop you're harvesting but all right um, so did you address mulching I, so was in yes i i did a little bit um as far as when you would put mulch down um i would say um uh, probably uh, it could be before emergence uh or you could put it down right as emergence starts to begin you you won't kill asparagus plant by putting some straw over the spears that so don't don't worry about that i if it was me i would probably I would probably wait in the spring until you just start to see some emergence occur. Uh, and at that point, then I would apply like a straw, a straw mulch or that type of mulch would be my, would be my favorite. Bark mulches could be effective, but I feel like it would take a larger quantity uh, of mulch to, to really get that nice mat to really suppress weeds. Uh, so I think a, a straw or equivalent would be the ideal source. So, okay. And then um, there's just a couple, you see this inner crop, strawberry, rhubarb with asparagus and how to handle wild asparagus question. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, um, uh, I, well, I see uh, there was just a couple, one that I, not to deter from that, I saw an organic amendments, basically any of your amendments, um, you just have to calculate it based off of the, the, the analysis of those amendments. So any amendments, I, I mentioned some commercial fertilizers, you can take, I listed the nutrient rates and that can be calculated off of any product, um, whether it be a synthetic or uh, organic in nature. Um, but uh, all right, so back to your, your intercropping. So uh, what I was meaning is that they complement each other at a market. They, I, I don't, I'm not that it couldn't happen, but I'm not envisioning any intercropping uh, more so that those crops all come in at the same time of year and can be marketed together when I was talking about them from a marketing perspective. So um, wild asparagus, um, that, um, that can be a big problem. Planting male hybrids that do not, most of them should not produce seed is, is certainly one major way to do that. We have Mary Washington and, uh, and it, it always, uh, you know, we have asparagus growing in front of my office in the flower beds. Um, and so, uh, how you deal with that, um, uh, certainly in most cases, if there's any cultivation or tillage, um, you're going to take out those young seedling plants, um, even or herbicides or even just any mechanical action, you can, uh, those can be managed. Um, certainly planting male hybrids that don't produce seed is, is the other way that you could manage that to the best. Okay. Um, and then any uh, sandy soil versus heavier soil, um, 
I think you've kind of talked about that with the planning depth a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing, planning depth to be how, you know, always look at the, the surface drainage, but um, I would, would, you could plant crowns a little bit deeper in a sandy soil. Um, uh, you wouldn't have to, but certainly in a heavier soil, make sure that you do not plant them, uh, plant them uh, too deep. Great. All right. Well, you know, I'm, we're going to go ahead and stop it there. Uh, I'd really like to thank Nathan for all of his uh, expertise and knowledge in this space. And thanks everyone for joining the webinar. Uh, look for an email from us for the archived version of this webinar, as well as a short evaluation. I have put up the QR code. You, I'm sharing my screen currently. So you could scan this and do the evaluation right now if you want, or you could do it when we, when we send you the link. So, so with that, um, we uh, look forward to your feedback and wish you a fabulous rest of the day. If we don't see you, have a great, uh, productive uh, 2020 growing season. Thank you, everybody.